All right, are we ready to go? All ready. Good? Ready, ready. Okay, let's do it. Hi everyone and welcome to the Six Bridges Book Festival, which is organized by the Central Arkansas Library System. My name is Eliza Borne and I feel lucky to be moderating today's reading and conversation with Margaret Wrinkle. So thank you to everyone at home for joining us on a gorgeous Sunday, especially one in which all the children in your life are probably bouncing off the walls like mine, ready to get into the candy bowl. Maybe you are too. So this is the final day of our 10 day festival and one of the very last author events. So I'm guessing that most people tuning in today are old pros at how these virtual sessions work. But just in case, I'll share a few tips if you'd like to ask Margaret a question, please open your chat box and type it in there. I'll try to ask as many of them as I can. I'll also go ahead and get this plug out of the way. Margaret has published two books. I've got them right here on my shelf behind me, um, including the one we're talking about today. And not only are they masterfully written, but they are beautifully designed treasures and you will definitely want to buy them to keep. I gave a copy of her first book, Late Migrations, to my mom for Christmas last year, and it's like one of the few books she keeps out on her coffee table because it is the kind of book you want to display and dip in and out of frequently. So I think there's a link in the chat, but you can buy the books at Wordsworth, our great independent bookstore here in Little Rock, and Margaret has signed book plates that they have in the store. So after the session, you should head to the Heights and pick one up before trick-or-treating. All right, now that I've gotten that out of the way, I'm thrilled to introduce Margaret Rankle. Most of you probably know Margaret for her wise, lyrical, big-hearted columns that appear every week in the New York Times. I've been lucky enough to follow her work for more than a decade, from the time that I was just out of college and living in Nashville, and Margaret was the founding editor of an essential literary website called Chapter 16. She gained a much bigger platform when she started contributing to the New York Times in 2015. By 2017, she had a weekly column. Her first book published a couple years ago is called Late Migrations, a natural, a natural History of Love and Loss. I work for the library now, but I used to edit the Oxford American Magazine and I was honored to publish an excerpt from that book. Margaret's new book, Graceland at Last, Notes on Hope and Heartache from the American South, was published last month. So as I already mentioned, I love this book, which offers a portrait of an American South that is generous and loving and spacious and also pointed and painful and entirely devoid of stereotype. Before I ask Margaret to read, I thought I'd set the tone by quoting from a passage in her introduction that spoke to me. Margaret writes, the South has always been so bound up in both beauty and suffering that it is impossible to untangle one from the other. I think that's why this region keeps giving birth to more than its fair share of writers. To love a person is always to love in spite of the faults that intimacy reveals, and so it is with a place. To love the South is to see with clear eyes both its terrible darkness and its dazzling light, and to spend a lifetime trying to make sense of both. So Margaret, thank you for writing this book and for trying to make sense of our region through your writing. So I have a lot of questions and I bet folks in the audience do too, but before we get to those, Margaret is going to kick us off with a passage that I think is going to appeal to folks, whether you spent yesterday's off day missing the Razorbacks or thankful that you got to spend a fall Saturday blessedly without football talk. <laughs> Well, I picked this one because I didn't have, there's no book, there's no essay in this book about Halloween. I should write one next year. Um, so I picked one about football. This uh, essay ran on December 5th last year. And it's about the first woman to play power five football, Sarah Fuller. And the title of the essay is, and play like a girl she did. When Sarah Fuller stepped onto the field at the University of Missouri on November 28th, she wasn't wearing the jersey she normally wears as goalkeeper for Vanderbilt University's women's soccer team. On that Saturday after Thanksgiving, she was wearing full pads and a Commodore's football jersey. Her helmet was emblazoned with the words, play like a girl. 
Ms. Fuller kicked off the, for the Commodores at the beginning of the game's second half. As she did, she also kicked through a glass ceiling, becoming the first woman to play in a Power Five football game. Other women have played college football, though none at the elite level of the Power Five conferences. This wasn't the culmination of a young woman's lifetime goal, and it wasn't a publicity stunt by a team in the midst of a humiliating season. Coronavirus quarantines had left Vanderbilt without a kicker, and Ms. Fuller, a 21-year-old senior from Wiley, Texas, was the team's best hope. The Commodores hadn't won a single football game all season, while Vanderbilt women's soccer had just won the Southeastern Conference Division I championship, its first title since 1994. And Ms. Fuller was a powerful kicker for the championship team. Though she'd been practicing with the football team for less than a week, she knew exactly what she was doing. Let's make history, she tweeted before the game. Derek Mason, the Commodore's head coach, said in a post-game news conference that he didn't tap Ms. Fuller for a date with history. Listen, I'm not about making statements, he said. This was out of necessity. Necessity. That team needed Sarah Fuller much the way the United States of America needed Rosie the Riveter during World War II. For days after the game, I found myself thinking again and again of Miss Fuller, of the confidence in her smile as she held a football helmet emblazoned with a message that was personal. Play Like a Girl is a reference to a nonprofit that promotes sports and STEM opportunities for girls. I thought of the faith that the Commodores had put in her not because a woman had never played college football at that level before, but because Vanderbilt desperately needed a kicker and Sarah Fuller can kick the holy hell out of a ball. I thought about the time I tried out for my high school's football team, about how when I reported for practice, the coach kept shaking his head and saying, are you serious? Are you serious? Over and over again until he finally told me where I could pick up my pads. As it happened, I wasn't serious, at least not about joining the football team. It was February, 1978, not quite six years after Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 was signed into law. The legislation for bad institutions receiving federal funds, virtually all public schools and universities, from discriminating on the basis of gender. I was an aspiring writer, not an aspiring athlete, and I wanted to make everyone believe I was serious about football so I could write a story about it for the school paper. Title IX meant I could play football if I wanted to. Was Alabama ready for a girl football player? All I can say is, Thank God Twitter didn't exist 42 years ago because Alabama was definitely not ready for a girl football player. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit, to save some time. Uh, if this were a made for TV movie, Sarah Fuller would have led the winless Commodores to an unlikely victory. In real life, Missouri shut out Vandy with a final score of 41 to zero. And in real life, Ms. Fuller's second half kickoff was her only kick of the game. The Commodores never got into field goal range. But there's one part of this imaginary TV script that Ms. Fuller seems to have played with a natural gift, the passionate halftime speech. I was like, we need to be cheering each other on, she told ESPN's Courtney Cronin. We need to be lifting each other up. That's what a team's about. As the quarterback noted, I mean, you can take a leader out of their sport, but at the end of the day, she's still a leader. This is the glory of Title IX and all other federal civil rights legislation. 
especially in parts of the country here in the American South, for example, where barriers are so often slow to fall. Such laws don't merely open opportunities for the people whose rights have traditionally been ignored or openly denied. They also help to create a society where hard work and natural gifts can benefit us all. A football team needed Sarah Fuller. Thanks to Title IX, Sarah Fuller had the training and the skills and the pure heart-lifting confidence to step up. Thank you for that. Um, my husband's a Vanderbilt alum and we were definitely rooting for Sarah Fuller on that day. So it was, <laughs> I enjoyed revisiting that game. So one of the pleasures of your book is meeting people in the South, a lot of people like Sarah Fuller, who are busting stereotypes or fighting to make life safer and more equitable for everyone, as you write in another essay. Can you tell us about some of the most memorable pe people or subjects you got to interview and profile? Well, there's a bunch of them in here. And then we stopped, um, we stopped uh, considering um, the new columns every week for around about March, I guess. But um, I've gotten to talk, I'm gonna have to consult with the introduction here so I don't leave anything cool out. But um, the, uh, I got to uh, take a tour of Real Foot Lake with a state park trooper who um, could point out all the flora and fauna of this mm -hmm. incredibly bizarre and unusual ecosystem. Um, Real Foot Lake is the only natural, naturally occurring lake uh, that happened because of nature and not because uh, somebody built a dam on it on a river. And it's it happened because of an earthquake mm -hmm. in the New Madrid Fault. And it, and it, depending on who you ask, might have caused the Mississippi River to flow backward and, and sort of create this swampy area. Um, and it's where a bunch of bald eagles nest every winter. So that was really a great thrill for me was to see all those eagle nests in the trees. Um, I got to uh, interview an urban shepherd, Zach mm -hmm. Richardson, who uses sheep here in Nashville to keep to to um, move sensitive vegetation out of, uh, I mean, invasive vegetation out of sensitive landscapes. I got to um, meet uh, Jimbo Matter, who take who gives tours of the Mobile Tensaw Delta. Um, mm -hmm. I got to talk with um, the entomologist who runs a special herpetology program in North Georgia about rattlesnakes. I'm just, that's just in the first section of the book, so I'm not going to keep going, but it's, it's really, that's really been um, a great pleasure um, to talk with people who aren't normally in the national spotlight and to really highlight the wonderful work that people are doing down here. That kind of leads into my next question, which is in another interview you gave, you talk about how you think of yourself as a generalist and that with every column, you get to learn something new, then move on to something different. Um, you write, I'm just writing about what presents itself before me. And I'm just thinking about what it's like to have to file a column once a week, um, wondering how these subjects present themselves to you. Does kind of having to live by these deadlines change how you see and experience the world? Or is everything material now? Oh, you know, everything, everything's always been material. And that's, that's the way it is with people who don't write fiction. And I think probably for people who write fiction too, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's impossible not to experience the world and have this little part of your brain just kind of filing stuff away that sometimes you don't even know you're filing away. I mean, when I was writing Late Migration, so many of those essays are based on family memory of stories from that I remember people in my family telling, but also things that happened to me as a child. And so I was sometimes just startled by how much I had filed away um, from early childhood, um, never imagining that anything, you know, I would have any use for it um, as a writer. But in terms of the weekly deadline, 
I guess it, it in some ways it's it can be kind of debilitating. It's like a treadmill; you never step off. Right. But uh, in other ways, I just am a firm believer that the more you write, the more you write. Mm-hmm. You know, when our children were were babies, my husband and I had this thing, and you know, like you never you learn early on with your first kid, you never let them skip their nap thinking that they're going to go to bed early the night, you know, that night when you want them to, and because the, they get spun up and they don't, well, it, it, you, you let a kid sleep because the more they sleep, the more they sleep. And that's true for writing too. So having a weekly deadline is a little bit like always having those gears greased and those muscles flexed. And I think it would, it was definitely a, harder for me to write these 1200 word essays back when I was writing for the times only once a month mm-hmm. instead of once a week. Um, so I guess I'm really lucky that I read a lot. I read a lot of books. I read a lot of magazine articles. I've had, I have subscriptions to so many magazines. It's crazy, but, um, I never know what that, you know, when that reading, I'll think, Oh, you know, when I'm, deliberately researching something. Oh, I did read something about that in the New Yorker. I did read something about that in Audubon and I go back and find it. Or sometimes I've even just saved the links in case they might come in handy down the road. The comment about the more you write, the more you write or nap and sleeping. I think the same is true for reading. You know, sometimes we get into slumps and nothing better than getting out of one of those and just reading and reading more. Um, well, with your process, are you kind of writing, filing, editing once a week you're done? Or do you always kind of have several columns and different stages of process? I guess it's more, um, it's sort of both. I'm, I, I don't ever, I don't have anything actually in the can. Like that's yeah. been my goal for years now is to, to have one or two pieces that aren't very time specific um, to say for some, I don't know, emergency or just if I want to take Thanksgiving off or something. But um, I never have really gotten far enough ahead to do that. (laughs) But I do have a running list of things that I plan to write about. And I started that, um, I started doing that back when I wrote my first weekly column with the Nashville scene before you even got to Nashville. Um, It was from, I think I wrote that column from about 96 to maybe 2001 or two, somewhere in there. And I, at that time I was afraid I would run out of things to write about. And I just kept these running lists with little descriptions, sometimes a paragraph, sometimes just a sentence. Um, So when I started writing for the times every week, I knew that that was a good crutch for me. I don't generally need it. I, there's, there's some story ideas on that list that go back to, um, 2016 or something in there. Um, and I'll probably never get to them, but they're there just in case I need them. Yeah. Well, you make the weekly, weekly deadlines look easy from my perspective as a reader. (laughs) They They always, they always feel fresh. Uh, well, here's kind of a, a broad question that kind of occurred to me when I was reading your book that depending on which essay I was reading, I felt either quite pessimistic and depressed, um, often about climate change or about our regressive state legislatures um, that we have in our states here in the South. But other times when you're focusing on activists or organizations on the front lines of working for positive change, I felt hopeful and inspired. Not a surprise, uh, given the subtitle of this book, Hope and Heartache Come in Turn in this book. So kind of my my broad question for you is, how are you feeling about the South right now? Are you you hopeful or heartbroken um, contemplating our future? Both. I think I'm always both. Um, I, I'm, it's not the South so much. The, the thing that breaks my heart more than anything else is how absolutely polarized our political discourse has become. And, and I don't, I think when people, I, I, 
I consider myself a progressive in the American South when people who share my politics um, come after me on Twitter or Facebook, or in some cases, mail letters to my house or um, direct message me. You know, it's discouraging how dug in people are with their view of the other politically speaking. I'm not talking about others in the other kind of sense we sometimes talk about it. I'm just talking about, you know, we have somehow become a culture who who really doesn't want anybody to change. At least the online discourse is. We don't, and so we, you know, as a, a the online discourse suggests that there's no point in having a conversation. There's no point in hearing the other side. There's no point in, because they're, they're so deeply invested in the other side as being evil and wrong and beyond remediation. And that is incredibly discouraging to me because I don't live in a political bubble. I live in a family that's divided. I live in um, a neighborhood that's divided. I live in a city that's divided. But I believe that so many of the subjects that divide us have no reason to be divisive. There's no reason for us to think of um, solving the immigration problem that we have right now as, um, as a situation where there are winners and losers, politically speaking. This is something that is in our best interest for all of us to figure out. It's in our best interest for all of us to figure out climate change. So, you know, how did we get to the point where it's impossible? If you looked at our media, you would think that that there are two different countries we live in, much less two different Souths. I don't think that's true. I just think that's what our discourse has become. Yeah, yeah it's um, pervasive and also mystifying. Um, and well, it started a long, long time ago. I remember my mother was griped. I remember when um, Occupy Wall Street kind of uh, started showing up on the kinds of news programs my mother wrote. My mother was a, you know, lifelong Republican. And she was, she was telling me one day that I should buy her a ticket to New York. And I said, this was when my mother was pushing 80 and living across the street from us because she couldn't live safely alone. And, and she wanted me to put her on an airplane and take her to New York and let her go to New York to occupy Wall Street. And I said, mom, what are you talking about? <laughs> And she said, you know, the rich people have taken over this country. There's no um, there's no room for regular people anymore. I want to go down there and 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 and, you know, wave my flag, too. And I said, Mom, you know that those people are all liberals. Right. <laughs> but she didn't. You know, she just knew that the position made sense to her. Right. That's interesting. So you've been in the kind of commentating business for a while since that first column in the scene and obviously writing for your own community is different than writing for the New York Times but um, I'm guessing that you feel like the way readers engage with what you have to say has changed since you first started writing columns. Yeah because it used to be you know um, when I first started writing for the for the scene I had to take a literal floppy disk back in the days when they were you know this big and they were wobbly that's why they called them floppy disks I'd have to drive it down to the to the office there was no email um so people had to write actual letters to the editor um I did I have a different last name for my families and um and then my name was in the phone book for a while. And so, I, and I had to take it out. I got a little concerned about some of the phone calls I was getting, especially for my children's safety. I was really, really careful never to use their names in the column. But um, so in that sense, it really hasn't changed. There were trolls back in 1996. They just had a different method of making their displeasure known to the writer. Yeah. Well, your most recent column in the New York Times, the first thing we do, let's kill all the leaf blowers. Um, I, I saw it kind of popping up on some of my Facebook friends who were sharing it and writing comments about it. And it, you know, I had read it and um, enjoyed the column but and appreciated it. But I guess I, I kind of thought, oh, this, this has probably struck a chord with people if I'm seeing it pop up in these different places. And then I went to the 
New York Times homepage and saw that it had had more than 2,000 comments, which I don't keep track of that very closely, but I'm guessing that that's on the high side um, it is. For, a, for one of your columns. And I'm just wondering, do you read any of them? Do you engage with, or how do you engage with readers is the follow-up to that. Um, less and less is the answer because um, I used to have an email address on my website. I had to take it down because um, foxnews.com now uh, uh, just about every Tuesday or Wednesday will write a column rebutting or just pointing out the, you know, idea, the wrongheaded thinking in my essay that week. And when that happens, there's always a whole new, you know, rash of trolls coming after me. So it's really, it's really hard. Um, it's really hard to justify tying up my only life on this earth, listening to people yell at me about things that they don't really know what they're talking about. Often they're only yelling about the headline and not even my headline, the headline that Fox News puts up there. Yay. So I, um, you know, I sometimes get uh, emails through my publisher, I sometimes get emails through my speaking agent or my um, literary agent, but, but uh, the really the best way to reach me is to write an actual letter and send it to my publisher and let them send it to me because I'm, I'm just really um, protective enough of my sanity <laughs> not to spend a lot of time reading the comments sometimes if I've written about something that's really very innocuous about like why I wear five wedding rings or looking and looking and looking for my great-grandmother's corn cake recipe sometimes my husband will read the comments and tell me oh they're all sweet this time you should read them but there will always be one or two in there even when they're mostly sweet when I first started writing every week, the novelist Ann Patchett, who lives here in Nashville, I ran into her in her bookstore, Parnassus Books, and she said, um, never read the comments. And she said, even when somebody tells you they're all nice, they're all lovely, there'll be one or two that, that'll, will, that will not be, and they will be what you are thinking about at three o'clock in the morning. And she's totally right about that. I hate it because I know that some people are writing really sweet things because I hear that they are. Yeah, I can relate to that on a smaller scale from my experience with the OA. Um, sure. Then I would be, yes, sometimes moved by what people said and how they were connecting with what we were putting out. And I appreciated getting to hear from them and engage with them. But yeah, hard to sift through the the bad ones to get to the good ones There's a lot of noise in the world we live in now yes and I do sometimes just wonder how how people have that much time on their hands that they can you know go to the trouble of looking up somebody's website or social media platform merely to tell them to call them ugly names it's a weird strange world yeah that's more about them than it does about you. Um, well, occasionally in your book, you make comments that remind me of an impulse that I also have, which is to feel frustrated by the people who write off the South as a monolith of Trump voters. Um, to, you know, think this is red America and that's that. Um, both of us know very well that this region is big and diverse and filled with distinct regions, distinct identities within cities even, and regions of the South as a whole and within states and smaller categories than that. And it's just impossible to typecast the place. So my question is, who do you think your audience for your column is? Um, Thanks to my newspaper addicted husband, I receive the New York Times at my house every day here in Little Rock. Um, so I'm wondering, are you writing for me? Are you writing for people who maybe do not have such a nuanced understanding of your home? Do you even think about that? I do think about it. Um, I can't think too much about it or, or I think it would be paralyzing, but um, I think it's maybe both. I think I'm writing 
I don't think you can write for the opinion section of the newspaper without hoping that it's possible to move the needle in some way to, if not to change someone's mind, to at least give them um, something to think about, you know, like maybe that there's, there's more to the story than they understood. Um, Maybe that there's a complicated factor that they hadn't considered. And so I think it's, um, I I do think it's hard not to feel hopeful that minds can change. Um, But I also have come, based on really the kind letters I've gotten from people, um, to believe that there's also some value in preaching to the choir in a way. There's also some value in making people who feel that they have been misunderstood um, to have somebody saying in a national newspaper, these folks are here and they're just as much a part of this community and they're just as crucial to the identity of the region as any stereotype you think you've, you understand. You know, I think both of those things are good reasons to write. You have said before that you try to use your platform to do two things, to amplify other voices that people who read the Times might not have heard of, and we've heard you share about some of those earlier, but also to muddy expectations as much as you can. And I think that kind of speaks to what you were just talking about. I'm curious if you ever muddy your own expectations through your reporting. Are you surprised by what you're reading, who you're talking to? Every week, pretty much. I mean, I'm not usually surprised by the Tennessee General Assembly, I will say that. But um, they have a a way of disappointing us in ways we predict, don't they? (laughs) There's, um, that's, you know, that's the whole, that's the way supermajorities work. Right. I mean, they're they're bullying platforms. There's if there are uh, more nuanced voices coming from that um, from that community, they are being systematically silenced by the supermajority. But um, uh, I think that one of the great advantages of being a generalist is that I go into something. I I am frequently writing about something that. I know a little bit about, but I need to know a lot more about in order to be able to write it, both to withstand the scrutiny of the fact checkers and the self-appointed fact checkers who read the Times, Mm -hmm. but also just because um, there are so many things that I know a little bit about, but once I start really digging into it, I find out that there's so much more to it than I understood. And that's really humbling and also, it, it, it's, it's hard not to feel elated, you know, to be 60 years old and learning something new every single week is exciting. Yeah. And if your readers feel the same way. Let's see, we are about, we're a little more than halfway through our session here. So I just want to remind folks, um, this is informal. So if you have a question for Margaret, throw it in the chat and I will I will ask it. Just a quick pause where I will continue asking my questions. (laughs) Um, So anyone who knows Margaret's work knows that her yard and the living creatures and native plants that you share it with are like a main character in your writing. Um, You obviously take a lot of pride and a lot of joy in um, cultivating this space. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about your yard and what, what have you been observing recently? Um, what's, what's interesting to you out your window and in your yard right now? And- I think I should probably clarify for, um, for, for anybody who's listening that it, I take a lot of pleasure and pride in my yard in a different way than most gardeners do, because, um, my, um, my yard, I garden for my wild neighbors, not for the human eye. So everything I plant, I plant because it feeds somebody. Um, and so, for example, uh, there, and that means 
planting almost exclusively native plants, plants that are native, not just to North America, but native to the, to Middle Tennessee. And, um, and that means that there'll be insects coming into the yard, butterflies and grasshoppers and, um, and various million different kinds of bees. It, it, and it also means that many of the creatures that subsist, uh, that whose primary protein source um, are uh, uh, is insects, and in the and the creatures whose primary protein source are the creatures that eat the insects. And mm -hmm. so it's a um, it's this wonderful life cycle that there's where something is always happening, even in the winter time, something is happening. But it's not necessarily beautiful. And to people who want a manicured looking yard, they want green grass and they want boxwoods, which are native, by the way, to England, not to Middle Tennessee. And they want crepe myrtles, which are native, by the way, to Japan, not to Middle Tennessee, feed nothing, um, instead of dogwoods or redbud trees. Those um, neighbors, uh, those folks, if they drove past my house, would probably think it was ugly. I, I think it's gorgeous. Well, have you, have you been, what kind of activity has been happening there? Well, it's a little alarming right now. I put a lot of these um, observations on Instagram because that's, I just have so much fun taking pictures. But right now, for example, the holly trees are both producing berries and blooming again because it's almost November. Tomorrow it will be November and we haven't had a frost yet. So the zinnias are still blooming and that's great because the monarch butterflies are still coming through just a little bit, one at a time, but there's something still for them to eat while they're heading toward Mexico. Um, there's also um, the, blue, <laughs> the bluebirds who nested in my uh, bluebird box three different times this summer are looking at it again. And, and it's like, I'm going, oh my gosh, please don't lay any eggs in November because it will get cold at some point. So there's a little bit of anxiety involved in watching what's going on right now. A grasshopper flew up to my deck the other day, a giant grasshopper. It's like, oh, why are there grasshoppers this late? But you can walk around the neighborhood at night and still hear the katydids and still hear the crickets. So that's both kind of fun and it's hard not to love crickets, but it's also worrisome. Like we need it to get cold. Yeah, for sure. Well, there's in the introduction to the book, Margaret talks a little bit about the process of putting a collection like this together, um, how she sequenced the columns and divided them into categories and working with her editor. And that's all very interesting to me how to how to shape this from these disparate parts. And there's some, I can't remember what the word was now, but you talk about like, there weren't a lot of changes to the columns I gathered um, from the newspaper to the book, but you made some edits here and there with like removing repetitions that came up um, that, you know, you wouldn't notice unless you're reading them all together. And uh, the repetition I really noticed reading the book was the word songbird. Um, oh, really? Songbird. I mean, in a, in a lovely way, songbirds are... Well, that's a word for which there aren't really any great frequent. synonyms. <laughs> yeah, I, had, I, didn't, I didn't notice that one. There are a lot of, a lot of appearances of songbirds in these columns, which was, which was fun. Somebody on... Um, Twitter told the story about talking to a new doctor and about having about, um, being a Tennessee native. And the doctor said, oh, I'm reading a book by a Tennessee, a Nashville writer. It's, it's a book about um, birds and death. <laughs> and she goes, oh, you're reading Margaret Wrinkle. <laughs> and she was, and the doctor was, I just think that's hilarious. That um, it's about, and she was talking about late migrations. It's a book about birds and death. There you go. Well, we've got a couple of questions starting to pop up. So let me ask the first one. Um, and this is from Nate Coulter, who's the director of our library systems. So thanks to Nate for tuning in. His question is, what's the weirdest stereotype of the South or of Southerners you've encountered and tried to correct? And, and I'll give you a fun fact. Nate is from rural Nashville, Arkansas. Oh. 
Uh, the weirdest stereotype. I don't know because stereotypes, I guess, become stereotypes because you hear them over and over again. Um, I think there, so I'm not sure that I know what the weirdest one might be because weird would suggest that it's maybe not as common, whereas to be a stereotype at all, it'd have to be fairly common, but there are some that are more enraging than others. And I think the one that I find most enraging is that rural people are stupid. Yeah. It's amazing to me how many people think that, um, that the level of your education are, is exclusively tied to the level of your intelligence without any sense at all that the level of your education is almost exclusively tied to the opportunities your community and your personal financial circumstances mm -hmm. um, offer. So if you don't live in a community with a strong public school system, if you come from a community where you don't have very much money, then you might not even consider college and still be so much smarter than anybody down the road in the biggest city. It just doesn't have anything to do with, intelligence doesn't have anything to do with education level, really. And ed education gives you experience with new ideas, but it's not a measure of intelligence. Agree with that. Here's another question. Um, another friend, Sarah Lewis, who's uh, the publisher of the Oxford American. So she, she asks, with writing a weekly column, does Margaret, do you put it to bed at publication or do you find yourself wishing for a different version as time passes? I feel like I keep answering all these questions with both. Um, but I do both. It depends on the week. I have an incredibly tolerant and supportive editor, Peter Catapano, who has a master's degree in creative writing himself and is very tolerant when I say, oh, um, I need to make a couple more changes to get rid of a, some repetition I didn't notice. Um, but generally speaking, uh, there's no copy editor working on Saturday uh, in our department. So what I have to do is finish up on Friday or in an emergency, in a situation where the story is still unfolding. And that happens more than you might believe, um, where I have to keep following um, news updates through the weekend. And then, then Peter and I'll get in touch on Sunday afternoon and make the final changes so in time for it to be recopy edited by the, the one lone copy editor who's on the desk on Sunday afternoons for a couple hours. Um, I would love to hear about your relationship with your editor. I would think that it's, there's a kind of very satisfying mind meld that would occur after working so consistently and frequently with the same person. It is. It's, um, it's, I mean, we're, we've become, I think good friends. Um, one year he and his wife brought their daughter to Nashville and stayed with us to, to do a little sightseeing. Um, uh, Peter's, uh, one of Peter's favorite authors is James Agee and he wanted to take his daughter to Knoxville to see um, James Agee's home place. And my husband and I have been to New York uh, several times and had dinner at their apartment. It's, it's a great relationship. Um, I do think I can be, um, it can, I, <laughs> I, I suspect, although Peter has never said so, that I can be pretty annoying because I'm not, I don't think, oh, like, yeah. I don't think like a journalist, really. I think like an essayist. So I want the language to, I'm paying attention to the language and not just to the most straightforward communication of the idea. And so trying to find a happy middle ground where I like a certain amount of nuance and a certain amount of openness to multiple readings, that, that approach isn't entirely appropriate to a daily newspaper. So there are some negotiations, but really I, it's, a, it's a great gift to have an editor who is attuned to language as well as to ideas because um, he, he, he reads the way 
I want a reader to read. And he can say, I think you've buried the lead. I think this is the stronger first graph. And so we move it up and I do a little adjustment and he's completely right. That was, that's a better lead. Yeah, nice. Glad to hear all that. Um, okay, I've got, we've got another question that's come in from an attendee. This person asks, is there someone on your wish list you would like to interview um, whom you have not gotten to talk to? Yes, I tried to interview Stacey Abrams um, before the Georgia okay. runoff election. <laughs> I ran into Stacey Abrams at the Decatur Book Festival in 2019. I, um, she was uh, giving a talk in the same venue that I was assigned to the hour after her. And we, we ran into each other. I was waiting in the hallway outside the restroom, waiting for somebody to come out so I could run in, dash in right before my event. And who came out was Stacey Abrams. <laughs> and I just stood there and she had these, you know, huge hulking bodyguards around her as she should. And I just was starstruck. And I said, oh my God, I love you. And she said, thank you. I said, I hope I get to vote for you for president one day. And she just smiled and she said, I hope you do too. But she was pretty, pretty much. And usually if a, if, if a New York Times writer asks to talk to somebody, people will turn them, their lives inside out to talk to the New York Times. That's, um, that's, that's, has nothing to do with me. It's just the, the platform. But so, you know, that somebody is busy when they don't have time to talk to the New York Times, but someday maybe. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> Um, okay, a couple, couple other ones coming in. Um, let's see. Okay, here's a question that is related to late migrations, which I'll hold up so folks can have a reference point for this question. Um, it is, can you talk a bit about the beautiful illustrations and late migrations? I would love to talk about that. My brother, Billy Wrinkle, is a collage artist. He is also a year younger than I am. So we grew up, you know, as they say, uh, Irish twins, the way they say in Catholic circles. Um, and we did a lot of little projects, joint projects as we were growing up, little gifts for our parents and grandparents and great grandmother, where I would write the words and he would write, draw the pictures. So Late Migrations is the is a collection of essays um, that began with my um, mother's death when I was writing through my own grief. And it took probably a year, a year and a half of writing before um, the other uh, writers in my, in my writer's group started saying, you know, you could put these together and make a book. You know, you're writing a book. And when I did finally, I mean, I resisted that idea for a little while, but then when I started thinking, well, maybe, maybe it could be a book. Maybe people wouldn't mind write, reading about grief and butterflies and songbirds. Um, I immediately thought that I wanted Billy to be a part of it. In that same way that we had worked jointly together, you know, not just on little family projects, but even like, Billy was the art director of the school newspaper when I was the editor. Billy was the art director of the school magazine in college when I was the editor. You know, even right through graduate school, we were kind of doing stuff together, but hadn't in years. And yet he was also grieving our mother's death and our father's before that. And so it made sense that he would be involved. And I didn't think about it at the time, really, but it's true that collage, the medium that Billy works in, is particularly suited to um, an essay collection, because that's in a way what an essay collection is also. It's taking little bits of life and recombining them to make a book. And that's what he does with uh, paper ephemera, you know, old maps and um, botany textbooks. And uh, he, he for, for the illustrations for late migrations, what he did was he ordered a whole bunch of antique um, photo albums that had those little frames. It, you, and, and if you look at the illustrations carefully, you see that the 
the images are all from the natural world, but they are included in the frame from a human photo album so that it kind of visually reinforces what I was trying to do in that book, which is to, to show a connection between the cycles of life and death in, in families and the cycles of life and death in the natural world. Well, they're really lovely and all in color and just... So. Billy also did the cover of Graceland at last. Um, and it's also, you can't, it's harder to tell from on a screen, but it's also a collage made from vintage postcards from around the South. Um, and in my next book, which I'm working on right now for Milkweed Editions, he is going to do an, an, a collage for every essay. So there'll be 52 oh, wow. essays and 52 collages. So it'll be, a, it truly will be a collector's item just as a physical object when that book comes out. Well, that's kind of why I mentioned that at the start of the talk. Um, Margaret's publisher, Milkweed Editions, is this wonderful independent press. Um, they, they make such beautiful books. And you will not meet someone who is more enthusiastic about checking books out from the library than I am. But <laughs> these are books that they really are special um, as objects. And if you can buy one to keep, I think you would, our readers would appreciate that. I was really interested in watching how many people on, on social media platforms said that they, with late migrations, that they read the ebook mm -hmm. and then had to go and get the hard copy yeah. because they realized they were missing the art. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, it's like, it's like reading the Oxford American in the app, which you can do and appreciate it that way, but does not be having the, having the real thing. No, it doesn't. Okay, let's see. I want to get to a couple more questions. Um, here is, let's see, I'd love for you to talk about this. Um, can you describe your journey and your early career and how you got to where you are? You've had a oh, few goodness. Well, I'm old. I turned 60 this week, so that's a long story, but I'll try to give the shortest version. I always thought of myself as a poet from really from fifth grade on. <laughs> and, um, and that's what I, even though I was, you know, very, very interested in journalism and, and on the school newspaper staff all four years of high school and all, all four years of the magazine staff, the, the general interest magazine at in college, I, I, I went to graduate school to be a poet and I wrote only poetry for probably 10 or 12, almost 15 years after college, after grad school. But um, when I was on bed rest before my second child was born, I had had two miscarriages between my first, uh, after my first child. And I was, um, I was 22, weeks pregnant when I went into preterm labor. So I had to be on bed rest. I couldn't teach. I was making my living as a high school teacher since you don't really make a living as a poet, or at least I didn't. Um, and I started writing essays because essays are, I felt kind of like lyric poems, but easier to write because <laughs> they didn't have any requirements where you, of, of um, form. Mm -hmm. uh, not not the strict uh, it, it was just a less intense form of writing about some of the same things I had already been writing about as a poet and as it happens those um those people do pay a little more for essays and especially back in those days in the mid 90s before the internet you know ruined the income of so many magazines and magazines pay really well and um and when my baby was safely born, I kind of didn't want to leave him to go back to school. So it turned out to be this great thing where I spent 12 years as a freelance writer for magazines. And then just as magazines were starting to really, the internet was really killing magazines and newspapers, I started um, working as, as Eliza mentioned, as the editor of chapter 16. And I did that for 10 years. So the the writing for the Times kind of overlapped with editing um, the, I think I sold my first essay to the Times after I'd been editing chapter 16 for five years. So I did both for a while. 
And tell us, you you talk about this in the introduction to the book, but for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet, how did you place your first essay with the Times? It was a um, it was just a strange little happenstance. My my in laws moved to Nashville not long after my mother died because they also were beginning to fail. My father-in-law needed open heart surgery. My mother-in-law was many years into a Parkinson's um, diagnosis with my father-in-law acting as her caregiver. So they both needed help at that point. And um, the, the next year, as my mother-in-law's situation was getting worse and worse, um, I was at the Southern Festival of Books and I ran into an old friend from Nashville, Clay Risen, who was there with his new book. He's he his day job at that time. He's now a, he now writes obituaries for the Times. But his day job at that time was deputy editor of the opinion section of the op-ed page. And he um, he was just asking how things were going with our family. And I mentioned that my husband's mother was really very close to death and it was it was terrible and wrenching. and. Um, And he said, would you ever want to write about that? And I first thought I didn't. I first thought uh, there was wouldn't be a way to write about it that would be not invasive, not um, a violation of her privacy. Mm -hmm. But then I thought maybe I would just try writing it anyway, even if I never sent it to the Times, but the Times was about to start a new column, not a column, but a new series called The End. And it was about different kinds of uh, end of life issues. And after I wrote it and my husband read it, he said, you have to send it because other people are going through this too. And it might help them to know that they're not alone. And so I sent it, it wasn't an, it wasn't the, that series wasn't edited by my friend. He sent it on to whoever was editing it. And, um, and that was the first one. It was also the first essay that ended up being, you know, the first thing I wrote that ended up being in a late migration. Mm-hmm. It's not well, in Graceland. I was amazed to, cause I didn't realize this, read in your book that it was the first published piece you had written, you, or first piece you had had published in 10 years or. A long time. Yeah. I just, I really threw myself into editing. You know, this it's um, editing. It looks from the outside, like a, like a more of a business, <laughs> but it's really an art and, you know, to, to work with talented and, um, and committed writers to make their work better and still sound like them and not like me, that was as much of a creative outlet as I really needed, I felt, especially with so much going on with elder care issues and my children growing up, and they were teenagers and and uh, teenagers are a whole different thing. <laughs> okay, well, we are, this is, our hour has flown by, but I wanna get to a couple, at least one more question. We've got our, our folks at home or, have questions for Margaret. Um, here's a. This is kind of a big one, but answer it as best you can. <laughs> okay. In our sh- short amount of time, um, can you talk about the sense of place and Southern writers? Oh wow, that is a big question. I think that um, I'm always. I always want to be careful by the term Southern writers. I want to make it clear that we aren't talking even though when people hear the term Southern writers and when they take Southern literature classes in college, they're usually talking about Faulkner, Eudora Welty, Flannery O'Connor, um, Harper Lee, uh, Willie Morris, if you keep moving a little bit, but it, that, those um, aren't the only writers. <laughs> those aren't the only writers in the South by a long, long shot. And um, our literature now is, has many, many voices, not just the white gentry. Um, and I think that that makes our literature, as, wonder, as much as I love you, Dora Welty, it's a wonderful thing to know that she, that she doesn't speak for Jackson, Mississippi. There's a lot of different people speaking for Mississippi now and, and together their voices are kind of a symphony. Um, but I think most, writers, I don't think it's just Southern writers. 
I think it's probably true uh, for m most writers who stay in one place or mostly in one place is that you, you do write what you know and you, and more, more than that, you write what you love, even if what you love, your love for that place is fraught and troubled. You, that's what you write. And you know, what I, what I love, what I know is the South. Well, I'll just make the comment that Tennessee is a second home to me. I grew up um, spending most of my summers on the Cumberland Plateau and lived in Nashville and still have dear friends there and return often. Um, and it is, it was delightful to me, um, sometimes sad to read your musings on the place and everything from your trip to a flash sale of props used on the set of the TV show Nashville. I was surprised, but uh, happy to hear that you're a fan of the show. <laughs> surprised? So, uh, yeah, although it started when I lived there, so I yeah. Put in that it's just kind of it's uh, you can't you could not watch it. Well, I have to say that one of the last things I did before I moved from Nashville was I I was very into square dancing for a period of time and. I showed up at a square dancing once and found myself kind of next to Scarlett, the actress. Who oh, was. really? I saw Scarlett in the grocery store one time, too. Yeah. Tra trailing this great long, you know, blonde tresses, you know. Yes, yeah. yeah, very. Uh, through the frozen fun. food aisle. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So fun, fun scenes like that to writing about the closing of an iconic music row bar and then also writing about like all the all the pain and frustrations that come with living in a city where condos are going up right and left and pricing out residents and what it means to live in a place where 100 people are moving there every day probably more than that now so thank you for your your depiction of Nash of contemporary Nashville um, I really appreciate getting to connect with the city through your column every week Thanks. So we are, it is 201. So I think I'm probably supposed to wrap this up though. We, we, I'm sorry I didn't get to every single question, but um, Margaret, thank you for being here. I know how busy you are. Um, maybe next time with the next book, we'll, we'll be in our post COVID future, or at least it'll feel a little safer. And I really hope that we'll be able to have an in-person book festival and maybe we can host you in Little Rock. I'd love to come to Little Rock. I would. And thank you to everyone at home for attending. And I want to let you all know that our the last author session with Donnie Walton um, starts at 2.30. And I just want to give a real big two thumbs up to this. Donnie's novel, The Final Revival in Opal and Nev, is truly my favorite. It's my favorite novel of 2021. I'm so excited she's able to participate in the festival. So um, if you enjoyed this session, please stick around for that one. And don't forget to go to Wordsworth and buy Margaret's books or come check them out from the library. So thank you everyone and happy Halloween. Thanks y'all. <laughs>